Good morning and welcome to the Regional Transportation Committee Tuesday, September 15th meeting. Uh, the first item, call to order. Second, public comment. Uh, Ms. Stevens, do we have anybody for public comment? If you are here for public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, I will go ahead and unmute everyone now. And then just as a reminder, if you're on the phones, please hit star six, and then I will let you know if I see any hands, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone from the phones and I am not seeing any hands raised. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we will close public comment 833. The next item is the July 14th, 2020 RTC meeting summary. Uh, if there are any uh, comments or changes, uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, uh, if there's anybody who has a, a hand raised, uh, please feel free. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm not seeing any hands raised. Great, um, thank you. Uh, the next part of our agenda, the action items. Uh, item four, discussion of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program amendments. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so good morning, everyone. Todd Cottrell with Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, this morning, we have two amendments for your consideration, both by CDOT Region 1. Uh, the first uh, is an amendment to their existing I-25 Valley Highway project, phases three and four. Uh, Region 1 proposes to reduce the state Senate Bill 1 funds from $60 million to $575,000 due to the COVID-19 impacts to state revenues. The remaining funds will be used for preliminary investigation work, uh, things like soil sampling and high-level design. Uh, they indicate that the right-of-way purchases are still a priority, however, it's just moved further down the list due to COVID. Uh, the next new project by CDOT Region 1 is a new project for bridge reconstruction at I-70 and Harlan Street, where $21.5 million will be used in State Senate Bill 267 funding. So these are the two amendments before you. Uh, both of these amendments have been found to conform with the State Implementation Plan for Air Quality, and the motion is to recommend to the Board of Directors the amendments to the 2023 TIP. With that, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Uh, committee members, if there are any questions or comments on this item, please free, feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six. Ms. Stevens, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll give everyone just a moment to get those hands raised in case there's any questions or comments. Okay, it looks like we do have a question or comment from uh, Rebecca White, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Rebecca White with CDOT. Um, not a question, but a, a comment here on these. I, I know this uh, funding amount um, is a, a little uh, peculiar, 575000 but I did also just want to note for folks who are following uh, the Burnham Yard um, issue kind of closely that we have also applied for a Chrissy grant um, to help um, move that project forward. And there are other commitments we've made to match that grant um, if we receive it. And we're tapping Senate Bill 267 dollars for that as well. This is, however, just some uh, some uh, mechanics with the tip to make sure that we're uh, allocating the 575,000 that's being used on a hazmat study right now in the right way. So I hope that's helpful and, and didn't uh, further confuse the matter, but I just sort of wanted to explain the amount there. Thank you. Okay, and I think with that, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. All right, with no questions or comments, I am happy to entertain a motion. Okay, let's see if we can get a hand raised for the motion. There we go. Looks like we have uh, a hand raised from Don Stanton. Don, go ahead. Uh, Don Stanton, I so move the question. Thank you, Director Stan. Uh, do we have a second? Yes, we do. It looks like we have it from Wynn Shaw. Wynn, go ahead. Thank you. I second that motion. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And uh, with a with a motion from Director Stan and a second from uh, Director Shaw, uh, Ms. Stevens, please feel free to open the line so we can ask for a vote. 
Okay. And everyone should be able to unmute themselves and make the verbal vote. All right. All those in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Against? Aye. Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item, uh, discussion of amending the fiscal year 20, fiscal year 21, Unified Planning Work Program, otherwise known, UPWOOP. Mr. Cottrell. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I'm not sure Doug's in favor of the word UPWOOP, but we'll let, we'll let that pass right now. <laughs> so just as a reminder, the UPWP is a two-year federally required document uh, that serves as the tool for the scheduling, budgeting, and monitoring of the planning activities um, for Dr. Cog's use of these federal planning funds. Uh, this two-year program was first adopted back in July of 19 and was last amended earlier this year in May. Uh, so this amendment is necessary to update the FY21 revenues, which was a slight increase, and how those revenues will be expended. And these are included in both tables, tables one and two of the attached. So in addition to reflect Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog's contribution to the statewide travel survey, survey 500,000 is being held back and directly paid to CDOT rather than transferring those funds between the agencies. Uh, the remaining 1.5 of the $2 million Dr. Cog commitment um, will be held back next year in FY 2022. So unless there's any comments or questions, uh, the motion before you would be to recommend to the board the amendments to the FY 2021 UPWP. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Uh, committee members, any questions or comments on this matter? Please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star stick. Okay, give everyone just a moment for hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any. All right, with no questions or comments, I'm happy to entertain a motion, please. Okay, I'll let you know when I see the first hand. All right, looks like our first hand is from Kate Williams. Kate, go ahead. So moved. Thank you, Director Williams. Do we have a second? Yes, we do. It looks like from Joan Peck. Joan, go ahead. Uh, it looks like you're self-muted, Joan. Oh, we might be having technical difficulties, so we, we need another hand if possible. Ashley Stolzman, second. Uh, thank you, Duress, or Vice Chair Stolzman. I appreciate that. Um, with the motion and a second, I uh, believe the lines are open. Let's uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? <clears throat> motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item on the agenda is discussion of the project funding for January 2021, June 2022, Human Service Transportation Set-Aside Program of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program and Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Program. Mr. Noon and Mr. Holson, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your time here. I'm Travis Noon. I'm a Senior Program Specialist at Dr. Cog in the Admin and Finance Division. And I'm here today to talk to you all about the, the projects for uh, the HST, the Human Services Transportation Tip Set Aside, and the uh, recommended projects for the 5310 Denver Aurora. Um, just as a reminder, let me get a little reminder on the funding. So Dr. Cog became a direct recipient uh, back in December of 2019 of Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding in the Denver Aurora urbanized area. Um, this funding does provide a, a little less than uh, 2 million annually um, for uh, transit capital operating and mobility management projects uh, that benefit older adults and individuals with disabilities. Um, in addition, as part of the 2020-2023 TIP policy, Dr. Cog set aside $4 million over four years or a million dollars annually uh, for human services transportation. Um, and this was intended to complement both 5310 funding and the Older Americans Act funding, but also go beyond that in that it does provide not just uh, transportation for older adults or individuals with disabilities, but it also goes into other vulnerable populations, whether that be veterans, low-income individuals, or whatever that 
that may be. It is intentionally left vague um, to sort of allow uh, projects to define that themselves. Uh, back in April, Dr. Carr released a call for projects for both of these two funding streams. Uh, the projects from these, this call was intended that these projects be 18 month projects starting January 1 and ending June 30th, 2022. The reason for issuing an 18 month project is to align this with the funding um, the AAA receives from the Older Americans Act um, with the transportation projects that are under there to allow us to uh, issue one call for projects for transportation for all three all three funding streams and sort of alleviate some of the administrative burden on the subrecipients there. Uh, this is Dr. Call's first call for the 5310 funding. Uh, prior years, this was administered through CDOT. Uh, we did issue a joint call with CDOT and Dr. Cog uh, for both of these last year. However, CDOT did manage the 5310 while Dr. Cog took on the HST projects. Um, the projects that were selected and you should have in your agenda packet, uh, the list of those projects. Um, the projects, the, the proposals that were received were reviewed by a peer review panel of independent stakeholders, including uh, members of CDPHE, <clears throat> um, Mile High Connects, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, and also a member of Dr. Cog's Advisory Committee on Aging. Dr. Cog's staff did participate in this review. Um, however, we were non-scoring members, non-voting members. We just acted as um, technical advisors for the committee. Uh, you'll notice in the re review committee recommendations that the highest score projects were recommended for funding. Um, a lot of the funding recommendations were, were reduced to match the available funds that we had. Um, you'll see that we uh, believe it was close to $6.3 million in asks, even though there was around $4.5 million um, that was available, um, estimated of being available for next year. Um, the projects, there were two projects that weren't awarded funding. Um, the committee felt that those were limited in scope and there was concerns about the high costs for the, the limited number of people served or the limited areas served under those two projects. Um, in addition, just to call out Dr. Cog, as per its project management plan for 5310, uh, it is, Dr. Cog is setting aside 57, around 57,000 annually from the 5310 pot to fund the Right Alliance uh, annual maintenance going forward after the, the project is, uh, the, the grants we have with CDOT are wrapped up. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but if there are no questions, the motion before you is to move to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of the HST and 5310 projects for January 1, 2021 through June 2022 as recommended by the peer review panel. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Daniel, so moved. All right, Director. Hang, hang, wait, wait, I need to recuse myself from this vote, please. This is Kate Thank Williams. Thank you, Director Williams. We will we will note that uh, with, with Director Tisdale's uh, motion. Do we have a second? It looks like we do from uh, Bill Van Meter. Bill, go ahead. Actually, I am in the same position as Director Williams. I need to recuse myself from this vote. Okay. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Appreciate that. Still looking for a second. Uh, it looks like we have one from Wynne Shaw. Wynne, go ahead. Yes, uh, this is Wynne. I would second the motion. All right. Thank you, Director Shaw. And uh, Mr. With... Chairman. Yes, please. This is this is Doug Rex. Hi. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I'm just a little concerned about um, having the number of folks to be able to vote. Arming <laughs> going on amongst the group about how. I couldn't quite, uh, Director, Executive Director Rex, I, I couldn't quite understand that there was some feedback. Well, I, yes, sir. I, I think my, my question is probably for Melinda to make sure we have the, the requisite votes in order to. Uh, yes, we do. We, we have enough votes with two abstain. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Um, Ms. Stevens, uh, if we can open the phone lines, we will um, ask for a vote when you tell me. Okay. Ability. I think they should be able to. Uh, Kathleen Bracky, are you are you there? Is the RTD board going to make decisions that are going to? Sorry. All right. Uh, yeah, everyone should be able to vote at this time. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone.
Uh, the next item, uh, item seven, discussion of the re recommendation of projects to be funded through the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology set aside for the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Mr. Cook, is that you? Uh, actually, uh, Greg McKinnon will be oh. making the presentation. I, I apologize, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, well, it's, I think that we probably should let you know ahead of time. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the uh, FY 2023 Regional Transportation Operations and Technology set aside uh, was uh, a tip set aside uh, that is um, established to make improvements or investments to support and improve regional transportation operations. In fact, you'll see later that funding has been recommended for CDOT, RTD, and several uh, local jurisdictions uh, as we move ahead here. Um, I'll, I'll first start off with uh, the review uh, process, uh, review panel process overview. Uh, back in uh, April, uh, the, the, this was uh, brought before the, the RTC, uh, the evaluation criteria and the selection process. And here's just a, br a brief summary of the, uh, the, the scoring factors and the weighting associated with them. The first four are uh, related to, to an alignment with MetroVision with a focus on operations reliability and operations coordination between jurisdictions and modes. The, the next two project need and impact are quantitative uh, evaluation factors. And then the final element, the risk management plan, was something uh, new that we asked for uh, with, with this is a demonstration from the applicants that uh, a, a the sufficient preparation had gone into the, the project and the, and the initial elements were well developed. In terms of the process, the review panel uh, individually evaluated the, the, the MetroVision and program objectives, uh, but for the, uh, the project need, uh, that was uh, developed uh, using the uh, congestion management process uh, weighting or score uh, that Dr. Cog maintains and the high injury network designations uh, from the uh, regional vision zero effort. Uh, and then based on, on the scores related to the segments in the, the network on uh, related to the scope of the project, there was a, a weighted score uh, associated with that. For the project impact, it was based on uh, emissions and congestion benefits submitted by the applicants. Uh, the, the information was um, translated to common units and then normalized by the project cost uh, and then uh, on a scale uh, 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 scoring was weighted uh, according to uh, how the results turned out there. And then there was a, a score on uh, the, uh, the uh, assessment of the risk management plan that was submitted. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, for the outcomes, uh, Starting off, uh, you know, the uh, the goal was to uh, prepare an ordered list uh, while considering some eligibility exclusions, which I'll cover in a, in a second. Uh, we uh, identified from the uh, the tip allocation and and project uh, um, returns or project savings uh, from the past that there was an available uh, 13.9 million available over the next three years uh, for capital investment. Uh, the review panel uh, going through the, uh, the allocation process um, uh, agreed to um, limit the project sizes to about a million dollars uh, you know, uh, by phase and so that had an impact on, on the three projects that are listed there. And I'll point out that the exception is Boulder. Uh, the, 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 um, in order to, to create a viable or a natural break in, uh, from a traffic operations terms project uh, is something that was uh, slightly larger than a million dollars was uh, allocated for that project. And then in the case of um, you know, partial allocations or um, uh, projects that, uh, that were lower on the, uh, the ranking uh, list, the, um, an ordered waiting list was also prepared uh, in, in the case that there are project savings or return funds uh, throughout the program. So the eligibility exclusions, there were uh, the, 
uh, eligibility rules that were included in the, the selection uh, process and uh, some elements who had to be uh, determined uh, ineligible and uh, there was uh, just a few of those cases and in that case the uh, the project applicant was uh, notified that the the uh, uh, those were ineligible and and uh, removed from the project and in two cases, the, the review panel determined that the, the projects entirely were ineligible for, uh, for uh, various reasons. The, the recommendations, uh, recommended projects are listed here, uh, showing the, the federal amount uh, and the cumulative sum of that federal amount uh, uh, over the, the list. The uh, criteria uh, uh, determined by the review panel shown on the left. And so this is the ordered list uh, for the recommended projects. It's a, a solid set of projects uh, that uh, is you know, focused on improving situational awareness um, my, mainly. There are some projects that, that are just um, uh, in setting to improve the transportation system foundation so that the, uh, the applicant is better prepared to uh, um, uh, coordinate with uh, regional transportation operations. Uh, but you know this the stage is becoming set you know for more advanced technology capabilities and services to be provided for uh, the region. The uh, uh, you know just highlighting some of the, the the RTD there is the transit signal priority TSP uh, two different uh, uh, projects uh, related to improving the uh, the efficiency of those uh, operations. Uh, ATSPM is a um, uh, automated traffic signal performance measures. Uh, system that many jurisdictions have been recommended for allocation uh, that will um, improve the operations awareness of the uh, effectiveness of their system to be able to um, uh, serve the traffic that's approaching the intersections. Uh, there are uh, traffic cameras or sometimes called CCTV and uh, in, in a number of cases, uh, uh, communications, which is the, the backbone of, uh, of the, the system operations of being able to send data uh, to, from the center to the field and between centers. Uh, there's also one project, uh, the Centennial uh, System to System Communications, that is actually a uh, led by Centennial, but is a, a group of jurisdictions uh, going to be working together, tying together their advanced traffic management systems uh, to be able to uh, view and perhaps um, uh, control their, their systems together as a group. Um, finally, I'll note that the, uh, the you can see the cumulative sum, the total recommendation is 14.3 uh, million, which exceeds the capital amount that I had on the, the previous slide. Uh, it's recommended that uh, um, the, that the portion uh, of the uh, Dr. Cog traffic operations funds be reallocated to cover that difference so that we'll be able to fund all of these projects. The waiting list that I mentioned is here, and you'd see that the project, the the projects that weren't fully funded uh, are at the, the top of the list, and so if, uh, funds become available, that uh, they'll be um, uh, uh, allocated to that project so they can continue on to make a full project. And then some of the, the lower scoring projects that are on the, the, the list here as well. The, the next few slides are just a, an indication of uh, how the, the projects are allocated by fiscal year throughout the program. Uh, the applicants had submitted uh, a requested year for funding, and in most cases, uh, we were able to um, uh, uh, recommend the funding for the year that it was requested, and only a few projects were moved to um, other fiscal years to try and balance the, the program uh, on an annual perspective. So the motion uh, before you here is to please uh, Move to recommend uh, Dr. Uh, to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors approve the FY21-23 RTOT set aside project funding awards and waiting lists recommended by the project review panel. Doug Tisdale, so moved. Oh, Mr. Director Tisdale, on on point uh, with <laughs> motion. Uh, we have a motion. Are we looking for a second or? Jeff Pullman, I'll second that motion. 
Thank you, Director Coleman. We have a motion and a second. Okay, so before we, we vote, are there any questions or comments regarding this item? Just to be proper. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have a hand raise. Uh, it is from Vince Buzek. Oh, uh, his hand went back down, so. Yeah, that was, that was to make the motion. I thought that was the process, but uh, I guess not. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Director Buzek. Uh, there's other hands. Yeah. Uh, no hands. Okay, Miss Miss Stevens, please open the phone lines, and we will uh, we will ask for a vote uh, uh, with with a, a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. Abstain. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the next section of the uh, agenda is informational briefings. Uh, item eight. 2050 small area household and employment forecast for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, Mr. Taylor, please. All right, thank you. Uh, well, good morning and thank you for your time and attention. I'm Andy Taylor and I'm on the line to talk a bit about the small area forecast that's used uh, in the regional transportation planning process here at Dr. Cog. I like to use this metaphor of a relay race to talk about where small area forecasting fits into the regional transportation planning process uh, because we're not the first leg. The work starts with the state demography office. They're charged by state statute with creating forecasts for population, households, and jobs. And they do this work at the state and county levels, publishing and updating forecasts for the counties annually, along with the work they do for annual estimates. Uh, we're the next leg. Uh, while they stop at 64 counties, we have to take their forecasts, what we tend to call control totals, and distribute that growth across 2,800 small areas, uh, what we call transportation analysis zones, or uh, TASs. Our forecasting work must stay nested within, within these county control totals. And then uh, with this information at a TAS level, Dr. Cog and others uh, can conduct travel demand modeling in order to forecast future travel patterns. Uh, the relay race metaphor will now fall apart when I mention two feedback loops that happen outside the regional transportation planning process. Uh, the first is at the far right in the bottom corner. Uh, Metrovision gap analysis is what we're calling it. Uh, Metrovision is the region's plan for the future. And with the current version adopted unan unanimously by the board back in 2017, uh, one of MetroVision's longstanding principles is that it respects local plans. So it's not our job as Dr. Cog or Dr. Cog staff to override local plans and zoning in our forecasting work. However, another of uh, MetroVision's longstanding principles is that it offers ideas for local implementation. And so we intend to start highlighting the gap between what this forecast shows and our region's aspirations in order to further the conversation about local and regional decisions that affect growth and development. Uh, the second feedback loop is uh, with the, the middle uh, column there uh, with the coordination with the state demography office on future county forecast updates. We're planning to work in 2021 to help local governments provide some constructive feedback on the state's county forecast under current processes, that office publishes preliminary forecasts around May or June of each year, uh, and then they solicit feedback from counties or other local governments, and then finalizes that forecast in November. Uh, with the work we intend to pilot, we would help local governments see how changes to the forecast might affect their jurisdiction, and thus help them and their neighbors argue for potential changes to these control forecasts. 15, 10, um, I've got more process slides later, but let's just look at what we're working with the, in the forecast for the region. By 2050, we'll be shy of, uh, just shy of 3 million jobs and 1.9 million households. Uh, please note that uh, the 2020 reflected here is a pre-COVID forecast of 2020. So let's look at this by decade. Uh, the narrative around this last decade has often used terms like rapid growth. Uh, surely some of that growth represents recovery from the Great Recession. Uh, 2000 to 2010 was only around 60,000. So averaged together, we would get about 272,000. Um, and we're actually looking to add another thing I would point out is we're actually looking to add more households in this decade we're in now uh, than we did in the last. And I've got some context to explain why and why that's not necessarily a given. 
Uh, but the last 20 of years of our forecast, uh, that 2030 through 2050 period, show slowing growth as some demographic realities start catching up with us. So let's put this forecast in context, and we're actually experience, expecting less growth over the next 30 years than we received over the last 30 years. I put the percentage change on here, even though it's hard without the absolute numbers to understand where the change is growing from, because it shows just how big the growth was in terms of where we started. Our economy in terms of jobs uh, almost came close to, to doubling between 1990 and 2020. And we're not even gonna grow by that number going forward from a, a larger starting point. And so we really can't characterize our growth as rapid if we compare it to the last 30 years we just came out of. We can't just assume that our past is necessarily the template for planning for the next 30 years. Um, but don't worry, I've got some explanation here uh, the caveat uh, is that all of this material is borrowed directly from the state demography office. The key point is that first point. Uh, we still have a strong growth rate compared to the nation, but both rates are declining. Uh, some of that household growth that you saw 2020 to 2030, that's being driven by that second point. We're facing an increasing number of retirements and we'll need to bring in labor through migration, but this is not a given. Uh, will millennials reaching some of their peak home buying years in this period find entry level stock or move to a region with more attainable housing? Uh, will these workers potentially migrating in from other parts of the country or world still find potential income here worthwhile after factoring in housing costs? There's, there's just a lot at play here. In the long run, uh, the growth slowing is about demographics. We've been experiencing lower birth rates since about 2007, and that's gonna compound as those once potential kids aren't there in the future to have kids of their own. An older population also means lower fertility and a higher propensity to move away, decreasing net migration. And a tightening labor market is also due to demographics, and it's just a matter of who is of working age, which will also likely contribute to slowing job growth. So with that important context, I just want to dwell on some process slides before I show uh, so, some, some maps um, and show you, talk to you about the forecast. Uh, 2019 was a big year for model improvements. We moved uh, our um, model into the, operate into the cloud. Uh, we improved how we estimated future capacity for jobs and housing based more directly on local zoning. And we added in the ability to factor in uh, scheduled development information about nearer term approvals. Uh, you've already seen some of our work in the first couple quarters this year uh, during forecasts for scenarios. We used regional control totals for that scenario, which was pooling those county control totals all together, which gave us a bit more ability to differentiate between the location choices between the different scenarios. Uh, what you're about to see in this RTP forecast, this regional transportation plan forecast, uh, we'll be using county control totals instead of this pooled regional total. So even while you were seeing and discussing scenario work, we were pivoting to the small area forecast based on county control totals. May, June, and July were our most important months as we reviewed nearly 600 comments from 29 jurisdictions. And now we're here today to share the results, which are also available on our data catalog. So let's start with our 2020 and 2050 household forecasts. The darker the area, the more households. White or transparent doesn't necessarily mean no households, it's just below the threshold we used for this map in terms of concentration. Often when we look at these forecasts, we have a tendency to dive right in and show the, the change maps, the change between 2020 and 2050. But what I like about starting here is reminding ourselves that there's there are already a lot of households in the region and it's important to see just how many parts of the region look the same. Uh, here's the same set of maps for jobs. If you're picking out areas you were hoping to see highlighted on these maps, but don't, please hold on for the growth maps where you may start to see some of these new concentrations emerge. And also remember that we have a limited amount of growth to work with in the control totals. Uh, here are the maps showing the change between 2020 and 2050. The, again, the darker the color, uh, the greater the intensity of growth. Uh, 
this whole series of maps is available as a PDF download alongside um, the spatial data on our data catalog. So if you'd like a, a more printable or, or larger version uh, than what's available uh, just from uh, the, the packet, uh, they're available there as well. And so uh, next steps, uh, tomorrow we'll be taking this again as an informational item um, about these to, uh, forecasts uh, that will potentially be used as forecast assumptions to be used in the air quality conformity runs for the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we're also at work preparing additional analysis that will inform uh, the discussion of this gap between uh, uh, this forecast and the region's aspirations in MetroVision and hope to bring that to uh, a future uh, Dr. Cog board work session, uh, hopefully as early as October. Um, and uh, additional work going forward um, relates to just work of, of, of for myself and my team, um, revisiting some of our models. Now that we've heard all this feedback from local governments, it's really important to try and understand how we can improve uh, based on a lot of that information that really could come from no other source. Uh, explore some uh, other improvements with um, control totals and as I mentioned earlier, uh, collaboration with the State Demography Office that we hope to pilot, um, that, that we hope will provide some value to all parties involved. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair in case there are any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Uh, committee members, any question or comments? Uh, if so, please raise your, raise your virtual hand or press star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment is from Wynn Shaw. Wynn, go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, Andy, you had mentioned that you use the county control tables, and I wondered if that, uh, how, how much that differed from the regional tables. Um, what we tend to notice is that, um, there are definitely some places where um, things look largely the same, um, but what we do tend to notice is that uh, the using the county control totals uh, tends to have, um, it just takes some pressure off of our uh, location choice models, especially on the household location choice side, um, really trying to stay closer to the state demography office. Where we see some differences may be uh, in uh, counties like uh, like Denver County, uh, where there's just a lot more potential for infill than maybe we would see if we just rely on our county control totals. We also see it in some of our mountain counties. We do cover some, some, some mountain areas that um, aren't seeing an as much growth as other parts of um, um, the front range further east and so those areas may have seen more potential for variation and change in growth uh, under regional control totals than than we're showing here uh, on, under uh, county control totals uh, but we were actually pleasantly surprised that that uh, for the most part we, we seem to be a little closer we actually I think did uh, with the county control totals did better in some counties that um, the state demography office has been reaching out to because they they do a lot of outreach to try and understand that distribution better. And so I think uh, uh, Adams and Arapahoe County also uh, saw some um, um, higher totals uh, under the county control totals than they did under some of our regional efforts. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wayne. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I do not see any other hands raised. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Appreciate your uh, presentation. Um, the next item, item nine, summary of engagement activities for phase two of the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cogstaff. So we've been doing a lot of technical work over the last several months on the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, some of which you just heard about in the previous item. But at the same time as we've been doing a lot of technical work, uh, we've also been doing a lot of public and stakeholder engagement. As we complete each phase of the planning process, we've actually been putting together um, a little report that talks about 
uh, some of the major uh, engagement activities that we've conducted and the things that we've learned from uh, those engagement activities and how we're using that as we go forward in the 2050 planning process. So I want to introduce uh, Lisa Hood, our public engagement specialist, to walk us through uh, what we call phase two of our public engagement for the 2050 plan. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Hood. I have just a few brief slides to walk you through kind of the key points of that engagement summary that's included in your agenda packet. So as you'll remember, the 2050 MVRTP process is divided up into kind of four main phases of engagement. So we kicked off the plan process last summer with the first phase focused on visioning and education. And then we spent most of the winter and spring really focusing on scenario planning and getting towards those investment priorities. And now we're right at the beginning of phase three, which is the plan development phase. So that's why like we came, um, or I came after the first phase to summar summarize what we'd heard, I'm here again to let you know what we heard over phase two of engagement. But first I wanted to talk about how did the input from phase one guide the work in phase two. So if you'll remember, we went out to a bunch of different events last summer where back when we were able to do such things. Um, and we also had an online survey and we talked to about a thousand people in that first phase. And how that informed phase two was we heard from those thousand people um, a high interest in transit, sidewalks, bike paths and safety. and so. That really guided the development of scenarios that could test situations that involved those topics. And so some of the scenarios included one that focused specifically on transit service, and then another one that focused on travel choices with an emphasis on multimodal safety. And those were based on what we had heard from the phase one input. So one of the exciting things that we did in phase two was convene two new advisory groups to help guide the development of the plan and provide feedback throughout the planning process. So we convened a civic advisory group and a youth advisory panel. I think you've heard a bit about them, um, but the civic advisory group is made up of about um, 25 to 30 members from um, all parts of the region. And they really are intended, the group's intended to represent the diversity of communities and experiences around the region. Um, and it's really people that are not typically involved in the transportation planning process. And then our youth advisory panel is actually made up of uh, representatives from our various youth commissions for the cities around the region. So they're actually, you might not know, but there are 18 youth commissions in the region. Um, so we have representatives from almost all of those commissions that are able to attend and they are part of this panel and provide feedback as well. And the key guidance that we've heard from both of these groups and kind of their priorities that keep coming up throughout the meetings that we've had with them throughout phase two are a high importance of the investment in transit, travel choices such as walking and biking, really an emphasis on equitable access to transportation for people, and then uh, especially focused and prioritizing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In phase two, we also were able to develop our online engagement site using um, a new tool call, called Social Pinpoint. Um, we had originally planned to have this site up and running for this phase of engagement anyway, but it actually proved especially useful during the pandemic um, as we are not able to have in-person meetings or do other forms of engagement that um, we've typically done in the past. And this site also allowed us to create a budget game to get feedback on the scenario analysis that had been done. And on the site, we were able to um, create presentation or videos of presentations in both English and Spanish to summarize the scenario planning results. If you all remember, you had a, about a one hour presentation that summarized all of those scenario results as a complicated topic. And we condensed those into about seven to 10 minute presentations to kind of provide the background um, that people would need in order to play this budget game that we developed. So we create, we had a, um, a main push of engagement during uh, late May, early June. So really, really in the thick of the pandemic. Um, before I get into the results of what we heard on the online engagement site and the budget game, I should acknowledge here that I'm, I'm sure that many of you have experience with your agencies with 
kind of the more long range planning engagement processes that have been occurring over the last few months. Planning for 2050 is maybe just not the top of mind for the general public right now. There are a lot of big and immediate issues that people are dealing with right now during the pandemic. So at Dr. Cog, um, there's still lots to be learned in terms of best practices for reaching people in these kind of completely unprecedented circumstances. So although we did get a good amount of traffic to the engagement site, we got about 3000 visits to this new site. We definitely did not receive as many responses to the budget game or the survey that we had on the site as we did to those previous engagement efforts in phase one. Um, we heard from about 75, 70, 70 to 75 people um, responded to the budget game and the survey. However, the results are very much in line with what we heard from phase one from those uh, about a thousand people that we were able to use those different engagement efforts with um, in phase one pre-pandemic. So um, some of you ha may have seen this, but here is the budget game that we developed. Essentially what we did was we took the scenarios that were tested, developed and tested by Dr. Cog's staff. We took their estimated costs. Sure. We did some math to make them relative costs. And then we added a fiscal constraint so that people only had $100 to spend. And then we asked people to fund the scenarios that had the outcomes that most aligned with their vision for the future of transportation in the region. So you can see, for example, the both the transit scenario and the managed lanes scenarios had an estimated cost of $90. Um, there were also some land use scenarios, so tying kind of back to the last presentation, um, which, uh, as you remember, didn't involve transportation infrastructure, so much because it's focused on local government uh, land use changes. Um, so they were given the lowest cost of just $10. And so people were asked to spend, they didn't have to spend all $100, um, but just fund the, the scenarios that best fit their vision. So here are the results that we heard through the budget game. Um, the most votes that were received were for those two land use scenarios in fill in centers. Um, but of the transportation scenarios, travel choices was the top choice, um, followed by transit with about half as many votes as the travel choices, which was the one that was focused on uh, multimodal options. And then the off-peak congestion and managed lanes scenarios received only a few votes from our respondents. We also had a really quick su survey that people could take as well after playing the budget game. And one of the questions asked people to rank what the most important goals for the Denver region to achieve by 2050 were. And number one was reducing the vehicle miles traveled. Two was increasing walk and bike trips. Three was increasing transit trips. Four, fewer people drive to work alone. And then the lowest, um, the lowest one was reduce travel delay time. We also had a great deal of helpful input from our local government and regency, regional agency stakeholders like you guys throughout phase two. Um, we, have, we are lucky to have a vast and extensive network of, of local and regional stakeholders. So your input and guidance as well as our county transportation forums has also really helped throughout the development and analysis of these scenarios during phase two. And then we were also able to give several presentations, mostly virtual because of the pandemic, to our regional partners throughout phase two, uh, just updating on the plan process um, and receiving feedback as well. So despite the kind of lower numbers um, and the restrictions um, due to the pandemic and the timing of this engagement phase, um, I do wanna leave you with my key takeaways from these engagement efforts from phase two. Um, first, just a, kind of an interesting one, the connection between land use and transportation. Although this isn't necessarily something that needs to or can be addressed in the MVRTP, it's certainly something that created interesting results in the scenario, the scenario analysis, and something that we did see support for from those who responded to our budget game and survey. So I think that continuing the conversation and studying this link um, is kind of the first takeaway from this public engagement effort. Secondly, in regards to the next steps of the planning process, the investment priorities and project selection. 
So what we heard from our respondents from phase two was support for projects that emphasize transit and walking and biking trips, as well as projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. So this is combining kind of what we heard from the advisory groups, the engagement site, et cetera. And then we saw limited respondent support um, for the managed lanes or off-peak congestion scenario. And then something kind of interesting, especially when comparing phase one and phase two, although in phase one in that online survey, we heard that people's main transportation challenge was traffic congestion and delays. Um, consistently, when we've been asking about investment priorities, reducing travel time and congestion are actually ranking fairly low on um, the priorities for these respondents. So those are the key takeaways that we got from this phase two, and we're excited to move on to phase three, which is the plan development. And I'm going to pass it back to Jacob to kind of wrap up and discuss the next steps as we get into phase three. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thanks very much, Lisa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, <clears throat> sorry for my voice, <clears throat> uh, we are now in phase three of plan development. Um, we'll be working on phase three through about the end of this calendar year. Uh, we've gotten, as Lisa mentioned, a lot of great input, both from our public, from our stakeholders. Um, as many of you know, we've been working with our county transportation forums, as well as our regional agency partners at CDOT and RTB, um, to really start identifying uh, candidate project and program investment priorities for the plan. Uh, so we'll be working again through the remainder of about this calendar year to um, actually put the draft uh, sort of 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan together. And then as we get into the beginning of 2021, we'll enter phase four, uh, which is really about reviewing the draft plan um, and moving that plan towards adoption. We are uh, planning to adopt the plan in spring of 2021. Um, and then it goes to our federal partners at the Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration. They actually have a federal requirement to review and certify our plan um, and they have a deadline of about mid-June uh, to do that. So that's really our kind of next steps process in a nutshell. So with that, we'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rager, Ms. Hood. Um, uh, committee members, if you have any questions or comments on this item, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it to you, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give everyone just a moment to get any hands raised for questions or comments. All right, at this time, I am seeing none. Thank you very much. Uh, the next, uh, uh, thank you again, Mr. Rieger. Uh, the next item uh, section is administrative items. Item 10, member comments or other matters. Uh, if there is any additional comments or other matters from the committee members, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens. Thank you again. And as I'm looking through the list, I see no hands. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item, our next meeting is October 20th, 2020. Uh, and with no further matters before this committee, we adjourn at 925. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.